this time I'll call the York County Council budget workshop together. I know we don't typically do this, but it just doesn't feel right um, not, not acknowledging since this is the first time that we've collected since the events of last week. If the council would just uh, stand with me and we'll have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you with heavy and broken hearts from the tragic events that happened last week. I don't think we'll ever be able to fully understand what happened. Um, we ask for your comfort, for your love, and for your help in bringing unity and healing to our community. We especially reach out and ask for you to wrap your arms around the Leslie family, the Shook family, the Adams family, and the Lewis family. Pray for their healing. Thank you for the law enforcement who protected us during those times. And we thank you for all that you are and knowing that you are in control. I ask for your wisdom tonight as we do the business of the people. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. First order of business tonight, we will hear from Jonathan Bono, Planning Director, to present a summary of proposed changes in the Recode York County Module 1. Okay. Good evening. I've been allotted approximately 30 minutes, uh, so I've timed this out to about 25, so I do need to go through the content very quickly. There is a lot of material to cover, uh, but I'm happy to address comments and concerns as you have them as we go through this. So we're here to talk about... Here to talk about Module 1 for the York Recode York County project. So the contents of this presentation are a timeline, remind us where we're at, cover the zoning districts, and also discuss uses as the consultants have proposed some changes. So looking at the timeline, I've outlined here in red where we're at for the project. We are in Module 1 of 4. So we are now fully into the drafting stages. We now have working draft materials from the consultants. So uh, this meeting tonight is to go over some of the high level changes to make sure that the consultants are going in the right direction as desired by the county, and then they can wrap up their final changes to module one before we have a published public draft for everyone to review and make comment on. So we will have that public draft uh, probably the beginning of May, and we anticipate doing a public meeting that will be led by the consultant team uh, in the week of uh, May 17th. So we'll be able to get direct feedback uh, from the community members. Anyone who's interested in participating, we'll make sure that's uh, across social media so people are aware of it and they're able to participate, ask direct questions, make direct comments. So I'll cover uh, the base districts, the proposed changes from the consultants. Uh, the first one here is AGC and AGC1. There isn't a material enough difference between the two to justify having two separate districts there, so their proposal is to consolidate that into just a single AGC district. And the same applies to RUD and RUD1, consolidating that into RUD. They've also proposed an additional district. There's a new one, PR, for Parks and Recreation. This is intended to include park land, conservation land, dedicated open space land, uh, this would cover, in theory, county public parks, uh, so Riverbend came to mind. And uh, additionally, the thought was to apply it to golf courses as well, so that if, in the event a golf course goes belly up, uh, we don't have an underlying commercial district where we have buy right development that can come in, as has happened in Regent Park, where we've got townhomes coming in next to single family and there isn't a whole lot of buffer in between. So, you know, necessitate a rezoning in a public process uh, to make any material changes to the use for a golf course. On the residential districts, uh, this is largely a renaming effort. If you look at RC1, RC2, RD1, RD2, it's not really clear what those mean uh, and what the uh, order of uh, density would be for that. So along with the open space changes that council made a couple of weeks ago, we changed the minimum lot size for a lot of those base districts. So now we have a logical order that's easy to name these districts. So RC1 would be renamed to RSF40, standing for uh, residential single family, 40,000 square foot lots. Same applies for RSF30, residential single family, 30,000 square foot lots. Uh, RMX would stand for residential mix at 20,000 square foot lots. And it's mixed because it's not just 
uh, single family detached in that you might have duplexes um, and other uh, similar residential uses. And also for RMX 10, it's another mix. So, you know, you might have your townhomes, your triplexes, your quadplexes at 10,000 square foot lots. The consultants have also proposed RMX 6, and this is a recommendation that comes directly from the comprehensive plan and part of their code assessment that the county should have uh, one more high density uh, zoning district, residential, and that's for in the future when the county goes into redevelopment, uh, redevelopment phase. And also uh, there's a renewed interest in trying to bring mass transit to the county, and that really can't be successful without the county having a, a district like this in its toolbox to when it's uh, appropriate to rezone a property to RMX6 to make those nodes work. Uh, for the commercial districts, uh, there is a renaming effort here as well. You look at BD1, BD2, BD3, you might assume that the higher the number, the more intense the commercial uh, development that might be permitted. That's not the case. So the proposal is to rename them. So BD1 would become uh, NC for Neighborhood Commercial, BD2 would be OI for Office and Institutional, BD3 would become GC for General Commercial. So that's much more understandable uh, district names there. There are two additional districts that they propose adding in. One is RNC for Rural Neighborhood Commercial. So it's designed to have an opportunity for rural areas to get a little more commercial use because if you look at the comprehensive plan, uh, there really isn't an opportunity to have commercial uses without having spot zoning. So we want to have uses that are more, more appropriate to a rural area like a tractor supply and that type of thing. The other one is OA for outdoor amusement and this would be applied to the Carowinds area. Uh, Carowinds and the places around it are zoned UD and uh, it's a very unique use obviously. Uh, so the thought was to create a, a district just for Carowinds so that they can have uh, their uses in there and the uh, uses immediately adjacent can uh, be synergistic with that use. For industrial, no proposed changes to light industrial and industrial. Those are pretty straightforward. They do propose adding an additional industrial district and this would be rural industrial. So that would accommodate some uh, rural appropriate industrial uses uh, outside of the USB. Uh, so you know, food processing, agricultural processing, those types of things come to mind. Moving into special districts, uh, we have two currently, TND, Traditional Neighborhood Design, which is Baxter Village. Uh, there are no other TNDs in the county. Uh, we do have many PDs in the county. Those are planned developments. They were formerly called PUDs. Uh, so there is a hierarchy that the consultant has proposed for these. So I'll go over the, the newly proposed districts in a second, but essentially there will be four special districts and there will be a set of standards that apply to all four districts and then there will be a subset of standards that apply to each unique uh, special district. So the standards that would apply to all of the special districts would be that it requires a site plan, uh, that it has to have open space between 25 and 30 percent, has to have amenities, has to have a lot of master planning involved. So that's a master landscape plan, sign plan, architectural plan, lighting plan. It needs to have a parking demand study so we understand how many parking spaces, uh, what the peak hours of parking, if there's gonna be parking spaces that might be shared across uses, all that type of thing. Uh, there will be a requirement for internal connectivity and that's not just internal roads but also the pedestrian network so people can uh, make sure that they have easy access to all reaches of the special district. Uh, it must connect to public water and sewer, and it must underground power. So those would apply to all four. So I'll go over um, briefly before I go into the new districts, Baxter Village. Uh, we are proposing to rename that to BV for Baxter Village Zoning District. We're not anticipating that that would be applied to any other uh, place in the county the list of uh, regulation that's in that district is so onerous that no other development would remotely consider it. On the outset, they would more rather do a planned development or one of these two new categories. So leave Baxter alone, it's its own thing, it's in place. Uh, no need to touch that, just uh, giving it a new name. So the two new districts, the first is the Business and Technology Park. So this is a recommendation that came out of the I-77 South Small Area Plan. Uh, so this is uh, employment-driven district. 
So you're going to have your office, you're going to have your R&D, you're going to have perhaps some uh, light industrial uses in there, and then also some complementary uses. So you should be able to go out of your office environment, take a walk around a nice amenity, grab lunch somewhere, and then go back to work. Um, so all of the uses that are going to be in the uh, B&T that's not employment will be complementary to those employment uses. So some of the standards that apply there that will uh, make sure that this is successful is there is a uh, minimum requirement of 50% of the building GFA must be for employment uses. So if we're going to create an uh, employment district, we've got to make sure that the employment is there. That's the foremost uh, use of the property. So that's why that's, it needs to be at least half of it. Uh, the other supportive elements we have uh, with the consultants established an appropriate cap. Uh, so maximum for warehousing uses because you don't want the entire thing to become a warehouse park. Uh, established a maximum of 20% of the land area would be, could be for uh, warehouse and distribution uses. And similarly, uh, it will make sense in some cases to have an apartment in this district uh, or some upper story residential on some of the supportive uses. So uh, there is also a cap there on 20% of the land area being for residential uses. There's no requirement to add residential uses. So uh, you could have plenty of B and T uh, parks out there that do not have any, but it is an option to have a minimal amount in there. Uh, some other things in there, uh, there's a cap on the density, so it, it can't be uh, a massive residential uh, density development. There's also a step down height, so it's a special district, so it can propose to have heights higher than the 50 feet that's uh, countywide right now, but the thought is to have a step down effect, so if you have a uh, corporate headquarters that wants to go 100 feet high. We don't want that at the border of the district next to some single family homes or other uses. So a step down effect would be achieved. So uh, coming down to that countywide cap of 50 feet at the edges. Mm -hmm. Needs to have access to a major collector or higher, and they need to have a transportation demand management program. So TDM is uh, anything that can reduce vehicle trips of a development that doesn't involve infrastructure. So they would have to put together a plan that says, we're going to have flexible work hours, we're going to have van pooling, we're going to have car pooling, we're going to have uh, bike, bicycle parking spaces, um, so, and you know, teleworking. All of those would reduce the amount of vehicle trips that are going to be pr produced by uh, B&T sites, so they would need to provide that. Uh, the mixed-use district, uh, this is something that's been on the comprehensive plan recommendation for quite some time. Now is the opportunity to finally add that into uh, the zoning code. So the minimum acreage would be 10 acres. Uh, that would double to 20 acres if the mixed-use district proposes single-family and you really need more land to accomplish a single-family residential, obviously. So that's why the acreage requirement goes up if that's going to be part of the proposal. Uh, so the mixed-use district needs to be truly mixed-use in order for it to be successful. So there are uh, mins and maxes that the uh, consultants have proposed. So the minimum land area would be 25% for residential, so at least a quarter of it, you can go higher than that. There would be a maximum of 50% of the residential that is included can be single family, as you do want to have that true mix of uh, housing options, um, and you want to have that walkability, and if all of the residential is single family, you don't necessarily achieve that. We also have a uh, minimum of 30% of the land area for non-residential uses. So again, that's that floor, so that you have the true mix of uses. Uh, we also want a certain percentage of the ground floor non-residential uses to be active. So those are going to be spaces where people are walking in, they're walking out. It's going to be a successful mixed-use development. Uh, so it need, also needs to have access to a major collector or higher. If there are single-family residential blocks included, they need to be uh, between 400 and six, 600 feet long, so we don't have long, sprawling roads of single-family um, housing. All of the buildings need to be pedestrian-oriented, so uh, I can easily walk in and out of a use, and I don't need to walk through a parking lot in order to get to uh, something in the mixed-use development. Uh, Along with that, there's a 14-foot pedestrian zone. So this is where your street trees would go. This is where your street furniture, outdoor dining, seating, all of that. So we want to really maintain that active space so people are out there and they're using it, similar to what you would see in Baxter Village along Market Street. It's also a requirement for parallel parking in non-residential areas. So that goes through the special districts, the overlay districts. There are three 
that are proposed by the consultants to be dissolved altogether. Um, but that existing language that's in there would be carried forward into different, more appropriate parts of the code rather than just having an overlay. It's not necessarily necessary to have an overlay for these three. So the, that language would be moved into buffers and screening or the land development code, which is the subdivision code today, chapter 154. Two overlays, the airport overlay and the transportation corridor preservation, just getting minor tweaks and updates. There's some map updates for airport and some language. Um, and for the transportation corridor uh, preservation, we'll have a document that's set aside so that every time a pennies project is updated, we don't need to come back to county council to have um, an amendment done uh, in order to incorporate that. Uh, three overlays getting a little bit more work than tweaks are the historic sites overlay, the uh, Lake Wiley zoning overlay, and the scenic overlay. Um, so the consultants have gone through a lot of the comprehensive planning documents, the small area plan for Lake Wiley, and they will be adding some additional uh, language into those overlays as well. So the legacy district is really where we need a lot of council direction from. Uh, is a major decision. So the UD district, uh, you know, the joke in the planning world is, is that you decide because you can do essentially anything except for residential in the UD district. And that's maximum flexibility, but with maximum flexibility comes maximum conflict. So uh, the consultants, they put this map together. It shows you've got all these UD parcels uh, around the Panthers uh, location. And you can see there's a uh, very small uh, lot residential development in Rock Hill. And there's a lot of industrial uses. There's a lot of single family lots that are zoned UD in there. So it's a big mess. There's 148 different uses that are in the UD district. So it creates a lot of problems um, for land use in the county, especially around the municipal boundaries. So the, the question now is what to do about UD going forward. So the three options that the consultant is suggested is uh, first to eliminate, that's the easiest, the cleanest option. Uh, so that would remove UD from the zoning code entirely, remove it from the zoning map entirely. But on the back end, that would require council to rezone all of the properties that are currently zoned UD to a different zoning district. Uh, and staff and the consultants could work together to provide you all with a recommendation of the most appropriate district for all of the UD properties. Uh, it would be an undertaking, but that's something we're prepared to do if that's the direction council would like. And just for scope, that's about 1.7% of the unincorporated land in the county. Option two is to carry UD forward as a legacy district, but try to phase it out. So uh, recommend maintaining the prohibition against rezoning to UD um, and adding a prohibition against expanding UD and revising that list of allowed uses down to try to remove some of those conflicts. Um, so maybe removing some of the more intense industrial uh, uses in UD, leave those to the industrial districts. That might be something we could do. Uh, and the thought is that uh, there would need to be a way to phase that out. So whether that's uh, when an applicant for a property would like to rezone of their own free will to a different district, or if there need to be other triggers that require uh, rezoning. And planning commission had suggested perhaps, you know, if a um, existing site were to expand its operation that we, we could uh, require rezoning then, or if a vacant property uh, were to be developed at all that we could perhaps uh, require rezoning then. So that uh, the consultant is prepared to iron out some precise options if this is the direction that council would like to go. Uh, the third option, uh, in my opinion, the consultant's opinion is uh, not a, a serious option, but it is one, is to keep the UD district altogether um, to allow people to expand it, to rezone into it, and to revise that list of uses and perhaps find a different purpose for the UD district other than anything goes. Um, so. I will pause at this point to, to gather any, any uh, feedback because the consultant is looking for some direction before they wrap up module one on what council would like to do with the UD district. Well, if you don't mind letting us know, I mean, at this point, as, as I understand it, the planning commission is already going through this module one process and they're being provided and I understand council is being updated, but I also understood that we have um, plenty of time before an actual ordinance is going to be presented to us yes. and wanted to ask you a little bit about um, what that timeline looks like and and I don't you know before council starts commenting on that right 
And there's no final decisions tonight. There's, if, if there was an immediate co consensus, it make it easier uh, for the consultants to move forward with one of the options. Because they do need to codify this some, somehow in module one. They need to write it up um, as to how that, leg that legacy district is to be treated. Just because they're um, adding it now into a working draft doesn't mean that's what we're settling on at this point in time. It can be changed up to at any point uh, before it's adopted in the late fall. Uh, early winter. I guess I'll go ahead and comment. Um, I, I think number three is, is, like you said, it's not a serious option. Uh, number two seems to be the most reasonable. Number one, I think we have challenges with potential downzoning issues and how you're going to rezone it after that. So um, I think the most most rational, reasonable one to look at is option two. Um, although, you know, I think the more you include folks and the less you just send it to them and tell them you're rezoning it, the more cooperation you get. And it, so that would take a lot more community involvement to get a better plan. Those are my thoughts on that. I'll, just a couple of things. Um, I agree, you know, out of those three, probably option two is the, the, the most doable of the options or the, you know, option three maybe is the most doable, but it doesn't really make a lot of sense but, um, if that's what we're trying to do. How much UD did we remove with our, Attempt at it a couple of years ago. Not a lot of acreage. Most of that with single family lots are all of it. Yeah. I know there was some of our districts we had quite a few people take us up on it, and some of them I don't think anybody did. So, um, and just for curiosity's sake, I, I probably can, you know, we can probably figure out all of our own, but. What would our definition of a historic site and a scenic be? What's the, I mean, because a scenic could be historic, but, you know, or vice versa, so. Yeah, and the language in the current overlay is not altogether clear, and uh, there is a list somewhere uh, where that language is based around, but it, it's not published in that overlay. So that's one of the reasons the consultant is working on it now. So that's part of what we'd clean up is yeah, figuring out what those definitions are. Out where those parcels actually are. Because okay. yeah. right now it's an overlay, but we don't really know where it is. Yeah. Gotcha. I, I would say uh, option two definitely seems like the best way because <clears throat> option, option one, I mean, if you were to rezone them all, you would have to what base it on what, what businesses are currently there. Um, so I'd definitely say option two would be the only logical way to proceed. Yeah, I think, too, I, I agree. I think option two seems to be the most um, logical move, you know, in regards to. Um, but I, I do have a couple questions, though. Um, when you said that this is going out for public meeting on May 17th? Around that week, yeah. Okay. So once, once it's approved, how much time do, say, there's an existing rezoning request in on a property? Is there like a grandfather time from when the rezoning, uh, everything's approved and everything's recoded that that will continue to go through based on like a month or two of, of allowance before, I guess all everything that's on the books now that's up for review would continue down that same path and correct? Or how, how, Good question. How, how, how are we going to transition? Yeah, how is the we transition? We don't want to stick a whole bunch of people all of a sudden that say, oh, you got to start over. Yeah, because uh, yeah, because there's what is that buffer zone going to look like? Yeah, I've, I've, yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, and again, we won't be into the adoption phase until the fall, mm -hmm. so that gives us a little bit of a window to try to flesh out with the consultants because this isn't their first rodeo. This is what they do for a living, um, mm -hmm. so we can flesh out with them uh, how we get to that transition. At what point do we cut off taking you know uh, rezoning applications to districts that are no longer going to exist? Uh, mm -hmm. once this comes into an adoption. Uh, so that's a good question. We'll make sure we iron that out in the next couple of months. Yeah, because I can see a lot of angst coming mm -hmm. from that. Yeah. Um, the other question I had is that you mentioned R RXM, or it was, it was RX, um, RMX6, excuse me, uh, mass transit, like rezoning. So I'm trying to envision, you know, are, are we looking at properties that we now think that we can eventually use for new highways or whether we go down with a light rail program and we're looking to rezone that now to apply that that rmx6 to it or 
How do you envision that? I won't suggest that uh, you know council look to proactively rezone anything to RMX six at this point, mm -hmm. uh, but it will be an option in the future, and not necessarily for council to initiate uh, rezoning, but mm -hmm. always could. It's it's a power that you do have. Uh, but it's more for in the future when we have some planning nodes around a uh, transit node uh, for mass transit that you do mm -hmm. have that option for a developer to come in and say, I would like to build around your transportation node and I've got a high density project that's going to make that work. Mm -hmm. uh, if we don't have the district, they can't even propose it. But right. If we do, council has the opportunity to review that, look at the neighborhood context, look at what else is going on in the area. Consider you know how serious uh, potential transit node is, and whether we have the funding to make that happen in the near future, and approve or deny that application as it comes in. Okay. So with any of these new districts, um, unless there is an interest in on council's part to actively rezone things on the outset when this is adopted, it's kind of a uh, you know package deal that we adopt the new ordinance and then we do some uh, council initiated rezoning simultaneously. Uh, there really won't be any of these districts in existence. So all of them will, there won't be any by right RMX 6 in the county. Mm -hmm. uh, they would have to be uh, proposed and they would have to go through staff review, planning commission, and council, county council. So there wouldn't be any by right mm -hmm. RMX 6. We'd gotcha. have to go through all of you uh, to target where they could and could not go. Okay. All right. Good. All right. Thank you. And I have one more that, sorry, that I, um, one problem I've had with our zoning code all along is. We started it 35 years ago, whatever it is, and, and there's been a lot of businesses that people have thought of since then that are illegal because of the way- Where are you going? I've got a slide for that. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, one more question as well. On the UD, um, and I'll bring this up because I actually lease a property that is zoned UD right now. On something that is existing, say a property owner has it rezoned, are the, are the Businesses that are there still grandfathered in? Yes. Okay. So any, anything that's in existence today would be grandfathered in when this code uh, would be adopted. Unless there is, you know, interest in a sunset provision or having some, you know, timed phase out of an undesired use or anything like that. I haven't seen anything proposed by the consultants in that light to date, um, but that's always a possibility. All right. Thank you. Um, Jonathan, can you, are we going to get, are you going to send us this presentation so we can look through it? Absolutely. Um, so um, I'd, I'd just be curious what um, properties are UD by district. I just kind of like to see what, I mean, we're looking at that one specific little part of, of you know, Rock Hill, but I'd, I'm just curious to, to, to kind of see, kind of have a visual of what is, what is UD. Yeah, that's and, uh, very easy for us to map. So okay. And the second thing would be a list of what are the allowed uses for that, just just out of curiosity, what those what those uses are. Um, so when you say that those properties, Brandon's question is, are those properties are they grandfathered in? Um, how does that work with option number one, where you're eliminating that? So they would be rezoned to the most appropriate district if there's an established use on the property, and the the use itself would be grandfathered in, and the uh, zone that they would be put into would be the most appropriate that they. So would they be non-conforming? I mean, so would there you might have... be some that would be non-conforming okay. if it doesn't exactly match. If there's some neighborhood context and we don't want to have an ID parcel in the middle of nothing but RUD, that would be impractical. So uh, we might, you know, zone it uh, RI for rural industrial, mm -hmm. but it doesn't quite the use doesn't quite match that. But it would be legal non-conforming at that point if that's the direction for option. So is there a, is there a point where a committee that is looking at a comprehensive plan for the next you know twenty years is is there a is there a time when when those folks are able to um, say that hey all right this should be RMX six. So are you talking about a, a like a, like a, like you you know you've got a group that's put that's working on a, a comp plan committee. Mm -hmm. Um, is there is there a point in time where those folks are able to say um, we think this this should be rezoned to to RM six? So um, there you've got the difference between planning and zoning. So for if there's a planning effort, so with the five year update, and then another five years when we completely redo the plan for the ten year, uh, you know that would be the opportunity that you're talking about to look at the future land use map and say, well, you know this area should have. Uh, some mass transit nodes or some mixed use nodes that we already have on the comp plan map. 
Uh, so it's the establishing what those future land use categories are and where they, they are appropriate across the county, but not the zoning districts themselves. But there will be an understanding that, that when you talk about, you know, this area should be rural, you're talking about AGC and RUD. That's what you're really thinking about in terms of zoning districts, but you're not necessarily specifying which zoning district it should be in when you're doing planning. So is, is the R RMX scares me a little bit because I feel like it is counterproductive to everything that I've worked for to get to get accomplished in the last year. Everything that we have voted on as a council to increase green space, raise the minimum lot size, I feel like RM6 is counterproductive to that. So is it limited to a mass transit corridor? It would be, it wouldn't necessarily be limited to a mass transit corridor. It would be limited to um, the nodes that are established and uh, neighborhood residential. But again, it's all, uh, based on what county council would approve because there won't be any by right and a lot of the problem in Lake Wiley is there's a lot of by right uh, RD2, RC2 and there's nothing there's no rezoning that happened they just when zoning was established that's the uh, the future land use and that zoning designation was granted that property that was their first original zoning there's nothing that council can do about that uh, unless they, you want to actively rezone property uh, so that's all by right development, so that's all coming down the pipe. That's not going to be the case with RMX 6. There won't be any in existence unless council approves it. Okay. Um, what is the difference in the, um, I can't read my letters, it, was it PST versus LI? Is it, oh, BT. I can't read my own writing. I'm having a wrist issue and I can't read my own writing now. But, um, I think it says BT versus LI. What, what were what was the difference in those two? So the let me go back. Let me go, go back. Um, so BT yeah. is the business and technology park. Yes, the business and technology park versus um, yeah light industry. So you might have some similar uses, and there will be a use table, and I'll, I'll get to that uh, next slide for that as well. On the use table, uh, there will be a list of uses that are appropriate in Ally. That's going to include most of the uh, less impactful manufacturing things like that. B and T will include some of that, but it will also include things like data centers and those uh, complementary uses that are going to support the employment that's on the site. So uh, that's going to have your uh, not your regional uh, restaurants. So it's going to not going to be an Olive Garden in there, but it would be your smaller scale stuff like a Subway and that type of thing. So the so the BT would it would include some light industrial category. It, yes, they would include some light industrial categories, but it's a bigger umbrella for for other. Um, okay, that's right. And right. unlike uh, LI, where you know there's really not a whole lot of standards to the district itself, there is a very high standard of development in the uh, BT district. So we're getting a very uh, good product out of that. District. So, so how would we change an area from light industrial? How would we change a parcel from light industrial to BT? At what point would could that change? And the most happen? common path is the property owner to come forward and to rezone a property. Uh, you know, if council owns property, uh, that's much easier to do. Uh, but it is within council's power to rezone property without the property owner being interested in that particular. There's a rezoning request by by a property owner. Or yeah, that's a... the most common. That's what you all see every every month uh, is those uh, property owner initiated rezonings. But uh, you know, council does have the power to rezone property as well. And if it's county property, it would, could just be council council. Yeah, you would need the, the property owner and the applicant. Okay. okay. So, so, so I understand you have a lot of a lot of. I mean, we're going to have an opportunity to we're yeah. going to have an opportunity to ask questions about all of these. The one that you, this yeah. is simply an update. Can you tell me, you know, if we're going to have a public input in May, what is the next step for council so that I can make sure council feels like they have enough time to yeah, ask so you all the questions? Yeah, so that draft will be uh, available uh, in early May, so council will have that. Everyone in the county will have that. And it's a lot of material, so this is just module one right now. Uh, so you'll have, uh, if you want to get into the weeds on it, it is going to take some time, it is going to take some reading, and more likely is you're going to have some property owners that have some in vested interest in a particular piece of language in here, whether it's existing and we're carrying it forward or it's new, and they might reach out to you, and that's probably the bulk of um, what you're going to get feedback-wise. Um, so we're prepared to uh, not only continue having um, public input meetings on this module, but the other modules, and uh, we'll go out into the community for face-to-face -face meetings once a little more of the COVID has passed away. Um, and we can, 
you know, get more feedback on the nitty gritty. Right now we're looking at the big picture, make sure the consultants are going in the right direction so we don't have to course correct in the middle of getting into the nitty gritty, uh, but there'll be plenty of opportunities both with the public and directly with council. And hopefully we will see that at least a couple of weeks before yes. everyone else so that we can address issues with y'all before we start getting caught well, from the public getting it. <laughs> you know, so if we have questions, I wanna make sure that I have time to look over it and answer questions and all of us I don't want to get it at the same time the developers and everybody else gets it and they start calling us going, what's this? And we don't know what it is because we haven't seen it yet. So. Okay, we can make that. Yeah. Yeah. On one, let me ask one quick question. On the BT, though, you stated that it can have up to 20% resident. Yes. Um, did, but if they, if they opt to go completely business, they could, though, 100%. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's, the, that's the key difference between that and mixed use, where mixed use requires okay. a residential. The BT mm -hmm. does not. Okay, okay. I'll try to quickly go through the rest. <clears throat> um, so this is easy. There are tax districts in the zoning code. They shouldn't be there. So the proposal is to relocate them into more appropriate chapters. Uh, this is what the use table looks like today, in case you have not seen it before. <clears throat> it's fairly straightforward, uh, but it will be getting an overhaul. It would look better. They're not going to do that right now. It'll be closer to adoption, but it should look a lot prettier. Uh, for the scale of approval, the P would be permitted or by right. C would be conditional, that there are conditions that regulate the use uh, before you can establish it. And special exception is uh, the highest that requires approval by the zoning board. So a lot of the use table is consolidation of like uses and definitions. So we are drastically reducing um, the existing uses that are on the books right now. Uh, we're also introducing approximately 60 new uses. There are some residential in there. There are unique industrial codes that are commonly used today, but are not currently in the zoning code. <clears throat> and there are other additions, such as farmer's markets, drive-in theaters, short-term rentals, tattoo studios, food trucks, uh, that kind of thing. So uh, those uses that really haven't been identified to date and problematically have not been permitted at all. Um, so in total, between the consolidation and adding new uses, we've dropped down from 216 in the table to 185. So more efficient there. So on that uh, line in the code where it says, if a use is not defined, it is not permitted. Uh, that is a unique animal to your county. It is not standard and zoning by any means nationwide. So what the consultant is proposed to do is bring us more in line with the rest of the nation and allow the zoning administrator to make a determination of a classification of a use. So if it's not defined, the zoning administrator will have defined latitude about what it is most similar to, so they can apply the same standards and the same approval um, to that use. So that should reduce that conflict where we've got, oh, we don't have that on the book, sorry, you can't do it, uh, look elsewhere. So we won't have that issue in the future. And there will be a way to make sure that when a zoning administrator makes a determination that yearly we add that use to the, the code so we don't have to uh, look for the paperwork and what was said when. Uh, so there's, uh, Use separation, so that's some of the uh, uses that need to be separated from either each other or protected uses. You don't want your adult uses next to schools, so that's that uh, use separation that, that's in there. Some other uh, minor tweaks and consolidations throughout. Um, one of the changes uh, proposed that I did want to highlight to you, because uh, it's a little bit different from what's uh, today, manufactured homes. Today they are permitted AGC, RUD, uh, and that's RD2, yeah, and RC2. Uh, so the, the change would be an RSF40 uh, and RSF30. So really the only thing that's changing is we thought it would be more appropriate to have manufactured homes be permitted uh, by right in the four least dense districts in the county. So we don't have that RD2, that RMX10, require a special exception and you can have your manufactured home there. So really swapping out that uh, RD2 uh, for the RC1. So that's the swap there. Um, and there's a lot of federal regulation around communication towers. So we're trying to make sure that we're up to snuff. Uh, so we ask the consultants to look into that. Last two slides here, are very quick and easy. Accessory uses, they're scattered throughout the zoning code. It's in the definitions, they're in the use table, they're in the individual district sections. So rather than have them scattered throughout, the uh, consultants propose to consolidate them into a single part. So accessory uses and structures, 
So minor things to point out there. Accessory dwelling units, they propose to be for single family detached homes only, and that the owner can occupy either the uh, primary dwelling or the ADU. Uh, for the outdoor retail displays, we don't have any language regulating that today, so some basic location standards, so we don't have a whole bunch of trucks uh, for sale stacked up, um, or you know, tractors and that kind of thing. Uh, do that a little bit better. Temporary uses, uh, also uh, it's sparingly identified in certain definitions, uh, but it is explicitly permitted in all districts. So we don't really know what a temporary use is other than it is allowed. Uh, so what's so the is that, So what do you mean you don't know what it is? You're talking about, like a, is that like a tree, Christmas tree lot or a farmer's yes, lot? Yes, so uh, yeah, I've, I've got a couple examples here. So what the consultant has proposed to do is to provide um, a couple of temporary uses that are uh, would require zoning compliance. And I want to be clear, this is not anything that's non-commercial on your private property. So if you got a garage sale, you got a you know backyard wedding, we don't care, we don't wanna look at it, we don't wanna regulate it. So this is really about mobile vending, so food trucks, lay down yards, seasonal sales, so those roadside produce for Christmas trees, pumpkins, that type of thing. So what is the, what is the definition, temporary is defined as what? Yeah, there is a definition in there. I don't have it memorized uh, quite yet. But is it like um, a one day? Is it like a, no, a no, month? No, it's not one day. Is I, it... I think it might be 90 days. It's, it's in, it'll be in there, um, so you'll be able to see what that is. But it's definitely not a too short of a window, and it's not too long. <clears throat> so we, like we have a fire truck, I mean, not a fire truck, a fireworks trailer that pulls in every year in, in Lake Wiley. And, and we've, everybody kind of wonders, are they, are they able to be there? Are they not able to be there? I mean, so is that something that's, um, it says it's permitted in all districts, but do they have to come and get a permit for that? Or? Yep. Okay, so, okay. So, and that's one of the examples that the consultant has. So well, there's a difference in permitted and allowed. <laughs> so permitted, in this case, means that they do have to, yes, they would the county to has that, to know they're there. Yeah, they would need to get that zoning compliance. That's okay, right. okay. Yeah. And that's it. Thank you. I appreciate your comments. And I think it sounds like from all the questions that council has, I mean, obviously, I can't remember. When, when, when did we adopt the last zoning code? When was the last time it was re revised? I think the last major revision was in 2000. I think that's what the history has, but no, nothing to this scale. Yeah, I was, I was a lot younger in my 20s, so obviously this is something that needs to be done, but it's a massive undertaking, and with the number of questions that council has, we, we need to make sure that we plan a full-blown workshop on this mm -hmm. item alone so that we're mm -hmm. not trying to rush things, especially since we have the budget coming up. But thank you for, for keeping us updated. I'm happy to death as much as you'd like. I've thank got you. one more quick question, Jonathan. Um, camps, such as like Canaan, Bethel Woods, do we have anything... Um, and set up for camps? Would that fall under the parks? Uh, they, right now they're campgrounds, um, so they're, they're allowed today as campgrounds. Okay. All right. Thank you. I just wanted to add that I was in my 20s when most of the code was adopted. <laughs> 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 That's a true story in, 19, in what, 85, something like yeah. that. Sure does. It was adopted in 85. I was exactly 20. <laughs> Kevin Madden, Assistant County Manager, Treasurer, Finance Director, Graham Poobah. Oh, are there any more we can add to that uh, to give us a budget overview? Good evening. Um, I met with each of y'all to kind of go over the budget highlights, and I don't plan on drilling down a lot of details tonight. You have your budget book in front of you. Um, please take your time and go through it and you can call with any questions you might possibly have. Um, a few things I'll touch on. Question everybody asked the budget, any tax increases? I just jumped to those. The, the Rural Fire Board, uh, Rural Fire Board Advisor, Advisory Committee, as well as management um, are recommending a six-tenths of a millage increase and that is to support five new personnel, um, three of which are going to be firefighters. So that is a follow-up of what was done by council two years ago. Um, that is the only, let's say, I'm going to say county-directed millage increase. There's also two other fire districts, and these are the special tax districts that are having millage increases. Bethel and Riverview, both of those, are again, are primarily driven by additional paid personnel. Okay? Um, we have a millage decrease recommended with the Lake Wiley Park District. The value of a mill in that area has gone up, and their other revenues are going up as well. So they're able to roll back their millage two-tenths of a mill. 
So that's as far as what are, what are my tax bills doing. Some of the other highlights, I'm not going to read through everything in here. I'm just going to touch on the highlights, then y'all can fire away at questions over here. Um, the landfill and sewer fund, uh, water and sewer fund, are both doing very well, and I want to talk about those, particularly for the new two council members. Um, I know Tom's dealt with a lot of fund accounting at the school district, but these two are proprietary funds. They're supposed to operate like businesses. Particularly with the landfill, we have um, for-profit competition on the MSW side of those things. Um, we do, it's, those tipping fees are where the revenues come in, and I like that. Whenever we provide a service and we can charge for that service that's paid for itself, that's a great thing. I had a phone call with a buddy of mine from um, Greenville today, and we were discussing their landfill woes. They have gotten behind the political curve and not raising their tipping fees, um, and their landfill is having to be subsidized by the general fund, not something I want to see us get in position on. We did discuss and consider recommending increasing the tipping fees for C&D. There is some room where we could raise that, but as of right now, um, Mike and Eric basically came down with, you know what, we have some additional capital needs coming down the road, but we're not quite sure what those would be at this point, and there's no immediate need to raise that. So we're not going to raise the tipping fees just because we can. We want to make sure we have a need for that and needs to be done. Um, we did a reallocation of the millage this year between the sheriff's solicitor and the general fund other. As we've discussed in the past, the general fund is still the general fund as controlled by county council. Y'all still have say-so on that. What we did, I guess, about five years ago, we broke out the sheriff's millage and the solicitor's millage, and we've tweaked that over the years a little bit here and there. This year, what we did was, I'm going to say, a, a major revamp of where the, that millage was set. The sheriff and solicitor both submitted their budget request as needed. It took a long time this year for us to set what we expected the millage to be for next year. Looking at the revenue coming from reassessment, this was probably the, the year of the greatest uncertainty is what we thought that millage might be. When we finally, this was really last week, probably about Wednesday or Thursday, we felt like we knew what the millage, what we felt comfortable projecting for value of next year. We took the sheriff's requested millage or requested expenditures as well as solicitors and divided by the new value of the mill. And that became their new millage in there. Now we aired on the side where they got a little bit extra that went to their, um, one of their, their fund balance appropriation account to sort of get it balanced. Um, and those are not numbers where we're, we don't ever want to have the sheriff where he's in a bind. I think everybody understands if our sheriff needs funding, that funding is going to be there. This was really done so the sheriff, he was con consistently overflowing in his bucket. He did it from year one and consistently doing that. He's a fiscally conservative sheriff, and he's not spending money just to spend it. And he basically, end of the day, had too much millage allocated to him. That's my just very direct view on how things were. The other side of the equation, the general fund other, we did not have the fund balance or the millage as the greatest source of revenue. We had millage and then a lot of variable accounts, and that makes for a much more volatile mix of things. We've been living off of the, um, the sheriff's overflow. That's where we got last year's budget balance. Not a good way to get things going. So re we reset those millages. Um, again, the sheriff and solicitor asked for what they needed in the budget. Um, and we reset everything and were able to get the budget balanced. We had a record number of new employees brought on this year. I talked about all y'all women individually. That was primarily driven by the fact last year we didn't add anybody. There were two positions added during the year, one the clerk of court, one for the um, coroner. The council approved during the year, but during the budget process last year, there were new personnel brought on. So this is really a catch-up year. We don't expect to have a year like this again. We have experienced great growth in the value of the mill. Our variable revenue accounts, if you remember last year's budget, we made it very clear we prepared those accounts as a worst-case scenario. We weren't sure what we are getting into. They did not drop in the worst-case scenario. They've come in better than expected in the budget. We're still not seeing them trending like they were before, everything with the virus and this and that. Um, but those accounts are up in next year's budget. So overall, I'm expecting the revenue accounts to come in strong next year, and they're able to support those new additional personnel being added without a millage increase in the general fund other. And as we've talked about at the retreat, um, when we finish this year, and you'll see a bullet in here about this, I fully expect to have a sizable amount that I want to transfer. I'm going to, we're going to recommend we're going to transfer out of the general fund into the capital projects fund to fund those capital projects we discussed over the retreat in the 10-year plan. And we're going to continue to do that with any surpluses we might see until we whittle away those surpluses. At some point in our capital project program, we're going to have to raise taxes to be able to fund those on a pay-as-you-go basis. And again, we're doing something very untraditional, 
um, with their capital projects. We've got a 10 year plan. We're gonna update that every year. And when we see projects coming down the horizon, we're gonna need to raise money for so we don't have to borrow. That's what we will do. It's what we told the taxpayers we'd do four years ago. We put in plan a place, a uh, program to pay our debt off. Um, I'll segue into that real quick. The debt service reserve fund in the budget amendment last year, if you all remember, we transferred over uh, approximately $10.8 million into that fund to fully fund it. And we eliminated the two mills that we had set aside to go to that fund. So that fund is fully funded right now and it's gonna basically sit there on the side and continue to accrue interest until 2024. We can use then the proceeds in that fund to pay the debt off. And uh, the debt service millage for the county at that point in time will go away. And if things track as they should, our taxes will be lower than they were in 2016, hopefully, okay? Overall taxes from the county. Now we're gonna have to stay on top of what we told the taxpayers we would do with our capital needs. That's why, again, every year when we have our budget or our retreat, we'll talk about our 10 year capital program and we'll stay on top of that. We told the taxpayers then, and we'll tell y'all when we need to, when there's a need coming that we haven't been able to save up for through a surplus or whatnot, we will raise the millage. I don't expect to ask y'all for a, a millage increase in the general fund until we're not generating a surplus. Right now, the variances around payroll, particularly unfilled vacancies, have been a lot higher than we expect them to continue to be, and we're taking steps in next year's budget to try to address that, particularly in HR. If you remember the discussions we had in the retreat about that, we want to be much more proactive and looking for applicants and filling vacancies as well as having HR as part of the hiring process actually in interviews as well. So we will see those variances dwindle. And when we go into a recession, um, that's when government jobs fill up. When times are going well, it's hard to fill those. So you don't ever want to get ahead of the curve with what we have in the budget right now. And that is the, we have the category of fund balance appropriation due to vacancies basically. So we're not taxing everybody for what we fully have in the budget because we always expect to have a certain level of vacancies. I don't want to get that offset be so high all of a sudden we fill up with um, our positions and we run a deficit one year because we got a little aggressive with that. It can be abused. We don't use it as a plug just to try to slap new expenses in the budget. We try to make sure we're on the right side of the curve with that. Um, Next thing I want to talk about, if you're following along here on page five, talk a little about what in, in essence is going on in next year's budget and how are we funding things. Overview of the county operations, you know, for another, the increase of a value of a mill is about $1.1 million we're projecting. The other revenue accounts about 1.3. The offset side of that, again, the record higher number of new employees we're hiring about 16.7, I think, in the general fund. That's the, the 2.1 and, and the 2.5% merit-based raise is in that 2.1 as well. And then the retirement expenses from the state. Those are the main things. The other two bullets um, offset each other. We're using fund balance, a, res a restricted fund balance to pay for the turn late around Carowinds. That's the $2 million. That project itself is about 2.2. That's a big uptick in the general fund expenses, but that we're using restricted um, fund balance for that. Okay. Also, the state, and this is a state number, they give and they take, it's in and out with this, the state medical um, indigenous, indigenous fund. That number from the state has gone up right now, and uh, we take that money and we simply send it right out. So that's the other big increase in the expense side, but there's also corresponding revenue from the state to offset that. Any questions about that turn lane up at Carowinds? Okay. Um, Flip over to page six, and this on this page here, you, we go through all the various funds, sort of a highlight of what's going on. I've talked about the millage changes, um, economic development. In this upcoming year, we have not in the past budgeted that 10% off the top on FILOs. With the new new Indy um, fee and low, all of a sudden that revenue's jumped up sizely. We have, um, I think, about $500,000 budgeted in there for the 10% off the top in that fund. That money is controlled by council for the purpose of economic development. Um, but that's an increase in that fund. Um, we've talked about the county debt surface reserve, the decrease of 10.3. The offset to that to get to the 10.8 is about half a million dollars. We expect to have an interest income. And that is really because we invested that money when rates were a lot higher than they are now. So we're, we're still gonna be receiving some good interest income on that. And I'll point out a couple of things the um, county attorney pointed out to me. The millage for the library and museum is not going away. It's just not increasing in their current budgets. 
and they're still working on finalizing their budgets. Again, we got the value of a mill out late, and they're working a lot, working on finalizing their budgets, but neither one of those entities are expecting a millage increase. Tim? Yes, sir, Tom. Yeah, cool question. Um, Riverview, Riverview Fire <clears throat> District, are they getting one new employee or two? Or it's um, multiple part-time employees, I believe. Multiple? Yes, sir. Okay. I think both Riverview and Bethel are bringing in multiple part-time employees. Um, you know, the, the Bethel Fire District, they've had some significant turnover in their board, and I'll talk a little about it because we've had to meet with them a couple times now. They've got a new chief out there as well. I think a couple years ago, we wouldn't have heard Bethel looking at hiring part-time employees. Their chief is um, hes a very aggressive chief as far as training, as well as making sure they've got what they need over there. And you'll notice Bethel went up six-tenths of a mill review and at 1.7. The primary driver in that is not the number of people being brought on, Bethel is a very wealthy tax district, okay? That tax district alone, I think, is about 315000 of their value of mail. The nuclear plant's up there. They do very well. Um, when we're going through this, I'll also point out they're also going to be purchasing a ladder truck that they need for some new apartments coming on board. They're using their money for that. So when management evaluated the Bethel request over here, you know, we see a fire department wanting to hire a new fire, um, firemen. We don't kick back on that. And they had a need for that ladder truck as well. They're paying for it and taxing themselves this. I would expect in a few years, um, unless they need more additional personnel, when they get it, we wanted to make sure that they're not behind the curve with their use of fund balance for the ladder truck. That millage might come down in the future, but they still have, I think, a couple of mills that they could go up if needed. But I've been very impressed talking with the new chief and that new fire board. They're a little behind the curve with the budget process. None of them were around last year for that. But I, I want to give Bethel high marks as well as um, Chief Hoard over there. Right. His approach to, you mm -hmm. know, what he's got to do out there for that tax district, you know, yeah. I, I really want to commend those guys and their approach and how they're looking at things. Mm -hmm. Those two fire departments, too, are mutual aid for each other now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah. That's really it for what I want to talk to you all about or point out. I want to take this opportunity. Any questions you all might have had since we all met to talk about the budget? Um, y'all can fire away right now, or if y'all want to digest what we gave y'all, um, you can always reach out and call or email any of us. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, David. We appreciate, you know, Thank the hard you. work. We know that yeah. you work hard to gather the information and to pull together, um, to put together a budget and present us something that is does not have a general fund millage increase, I think is important, especially coming off of this tough year with COVID. So I um, appreciate the hard work. A couple of things. Um, the budget mes message and the attachments to that, the summary, as well as the rest of it, but especially that part, can you please make that available as a link so that folks can take a look at that and that be available to the public and they can yes, take a look at that? Mm -hmm. um, and I understand first reading is set for this on May 3rd, and then we'll have another budget workshop on May 11th. I think we've got a workshop between now and May 1st, I believe, as well. Do we? I, I didn't so. see it on our budget. I didn't see it on our budget calendar. No. Do you, do you want to meet again? We can't. <laughs> no. As needed, seriously. I, I know we've got two new council members. Tom, you've got some experience going through these budgets other than with the proprietary funds, but reach out to us with any questions you might have. Mm -hmm. you, you were just given a, about a three-inch thick um, notebook full of things. And I think as long as we communicate through this, we can um, handle any issues or questions you all might have that come up over here. I We will update the budget message, particularly the key components – before we get to first reading, I hope to have a better idea as to what that transfer is going to be into the Capital Projects Fund, as well as the um, the budget for the library museum will be taken care of before then. And also, we have a new tax district that's going to be in this coming up budget. That board still has to meet, but that will be part of the new budget message. What we'll do, every time we meet or update the budget message, if it's not until the first reading, I'll hand you another copy with a different date in there you can put on top of this one. So you can kind of keep track of the changes. We'll make sure to do the same thing um, with what's going to be online. I would like to, to really thank everybody in the, in the finance department that worked on putting this together. Um, really want to, we had a bit of a hiccup in the last week. Gar Sawyer, our controller, um, been keeping your prayers, he's in the hospital right now. Um, he got it sick last week, and he's still in the hospital right now. Made finishing this up a bit of a challenge right now, but we had Mr. Siegler. Um, the, he's the county auditor and over internal to help out to get this put together as well as Trish today stepped in to make sure we had all the wording in there properly. So a lot of people worked to get this together for y'all today. Mm -hmm. And um, please keep Mr. Sawyer in your prayers as well. And hopefully he's back to work soon. Will do. Nice, mm -hmm. nice work. 
I just got it. I do have a quick comment on this. Um, you know, from the solid waste fun, uh, collection fund, you know, and when we talk about MSW and having to ship that to Columbia, you know, I think personally, I'd like to see maybe us look at down the road, looking at an incinerator that could eventually be applied that we could then stop sending, having to ship that stuff away, incinerate it here. I know would probably be a partnership maybe, or we would run it, but we'd probably have other districts wanting to use it. So there may even be a revenue opportunity there from that perspective. I, th I think that's a, a great idea. Honestly, we've had some presentations presented in the past about that concept. Mm -hmm. I think there's some challenges um, with that state, state level as far as whether that's going to be legal or not. I think that is a great idea, Tom. The byproduct of those incinerators is basically a powder that goes into cement. The air yeah. comes out just fine. Yeah. The challenge is you have to bring in trash from a lot of different places to do it. Mm -hmm. um, I do think when the timing's right, I would like to see York County pursue that and drill down that ever because I do think that'd be a good thing for the county. But like anything else, we do want to make sure we kind of vet everything mm -hmm. out. Um, and don't jump into it blindly, but I think yeah. that concept is a great concept. Yeah, I think just just kind of talking about planting the seed a little bit. Yes, sir. Around it, so yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Good comment. I have just, a request. Who's next, Robert? Go ahead, Robert. I just quickly, um, <laughs> I'm a little confused because um, on the uh, table we're showing a tenth of a mil for the sheriff and a tenth of a mil for us for general fund. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. One thing I need to point out over here, and I, I hope I talked to you all about this with you all individually, the sheriff in the budget we've got going over here, we're sliding over the prison to the sheriff. So the prison is going to be under the control of the sheriff. Management thinks that's a great idea. The sheriff is willing to take on that additional responsibility. It, it makes sense. It's one of those common sense type things to do. So that is why, um, even though we, it's two point, I forget the exact dollar amount, but it's, it's probably about two and a half million dollars of the, the actual real expenses getting moved between the sheriff's office and ours, ours, but the reason why his millage increase or increase is so small um, is be the offset of the value of the mill going up along with him taking over the prison operations. I hope I had talked with you all about that when we met, but that is um, another big thing going on this budget, taking that out from public works where we have everything from, um, you know, the, 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 Animal control, uh, we've got like eight different things in our public works, but really the prison did not fit. So moving him under the sheriff, we felt like was the right thing to do. But thanks for bringing that up. I should have pointed that out. And the tenth of a mil in general fund. I thought we weren't increasing the general fund. Any, so. The general fund is not. Okay. Again, inside the general fund, you've got three silos. We've got the solicitor, the sheriff, and then the general fund other. So when we reallocated that millage between those three, and, there, and, and a key component of that was the shifting of the prison over there, the solicitor who didn't take on any additional expenses and he had the smallest of those, his went down two tenths of a mil and the sheriff's and the rest of ours up a tenth. Yeah. Okay. And that was basically just getting everything, hitting a, I look at it as almost a reset button with where we're at. And as we go through upcoming budgets, we have those silos set up and the sheriff has his name on the tax bill, but you know, York County Council has always been extremely supportive of the sheriff, as is management. And as things move around or need to move around, we're going to make sure we're there to support the sheriff, whatever his financial needs are. What this reallocation will ultimately do, we won't see this giant waterfall going back into the general fund on the side because right now his 10% committed bucket is tapped out. Okay, Just like we want to not have big surpluses every year, same thing with the sheriff. That's what he's trying to do. He's not really looking forward to having his name on the tax bill for a millage of this and having it flow over the general fund unassigned. So, but we will, as needed in future years, move that around. And I don't want anybody ever to think that, um, again, what we've done in the general fund is in any way, shape, or form to limit the sheriff's ability to have more funds if he needs it, or um, you know, us for that matter as well. I've never been afraid to roll back taxes or if need be to ask for tax increase our job is, again, to make sure we can explain it to y'all so y'all can explain it to the taxpayers. And as you all sent me out to do numerous times, if you want me to talk to the taxpayers about why it's needed, we'll do that. That's our job to make sure we can explain any requests we might have. And if either of you two new council members would like to look at last year's as a reference, I still have last year's. I, kept, <laughs> I keep one previous year, so I have it because I go back and reference it myself sometimes. So. It's great for insomnia. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. So I would, I would like to um, request um, council support to have um, management um, look at the, um, 
rec funding for municipalities and would, would be interested in seeing um, what that allocation formula would look like if we were to include Field Day Park in that because we are um, now offering actually the same services as the um, in, in the unincorporated area now as um, the municipalities are. So um, that is um, something that would be, um, I think, beneficial to the, um, obviously beneficial to um, Field Day Park and to the taxpayers that are actually funding funding that park. So um, just would like to know what that, what that formula looks like and if, if we can, um, whether or not you would recommend that. I've been interested in seeing what it looks like. I don't see any harm in it. I think the, the time is now to, to approach the, the municipalities and take a look at it and see how to, how to how they respond to that and get a recommendation from management. And that reminded me of one other question. I'm sorry. When we talk about funding that's been set for a while, um, I don't know that we've ever increased the allocation to the fire districts, the violence, or excuse me, to the fire departments for their general fund for having a station. We've allocated the same $5,600 or $6,500 or whatever it is every year to each one of those. Have we ever looked at uh, all the expenses go up in all these fire stations and stuff? And I know we, we give them an allotment based on how many fire stations they have and stuff. And I think we've, as far as I know, at least in the last six years, we haven't changed that allotment for them at all. Now, I know they, they can get equipment and they get other stuff through the Rural Fire Board, but that allotment for our volunteer stations is a lot. I mean, that's, that's you know, that's a big chunk of some of their budgets, and we haven't increased that as far as I know ever. I think, um, you know, Morris, who's not here tonight, he went through that budget, and he's... Morris is the one that really works on preparing that and, and it's reviewed by management. When he prepared that this year, I do know he met with the, um, I think Darner or the chiefs were probably there, but he also met with the advisory board and they went through and approved that budget. I'm not sure if that particular line item was a discussion of topic, but that's something we'll circle back with. And, and, and I don't, just, not necessarily for this year's budget. I just think it's something food we, for thought we should for more look at. You know, if we've never increased their allotment, we ought to look at it at some point, I think. So. I know in... One thing that he did incorporate in the 10-year the capital plan for fire, which was also reviewed by the advisory council, there is um, the rural fire department, or whatever you want to call it now, what's funded by that millage, is now providing a lot more, particularly in the form of the air packs for the fire districts as well. So that has been stepped up. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's a good point for, if not now, but for next year to consider and yeah. to think about. I'll make one comment on that. I, I, I think what's interesting, and I'll intend to, to raise this once we get into the actual third readings and, and when we workshop this further, but I think all of the um, fire districts have actually got um, an increase in their budgets due to the increase in the value of the mill, with the exception of one, which ha happened to be Leslie, and that's attributable to the Philo, um, in part, the issue that happened with New Indy and the um, re acquisition by the new purchaser. But... Um, I would ask council to also take a look at um, how that philo um, impacted Leslie because they were a huge contributor and that combined with the fact that we did the philo product development fund on that particular um, philo which was a, a an acquisition and not new um, not solely new uh, revenue to the county that's something I think we need to take a look at um, as you, we go move through the budget process so are you saying that the the, the money that the county was getting actually went down. When Leslie's you, money went down. Actually, the, the entire county's did. And yeah. if you if you all don't yeah. mind, I'd be interested preparing in that information that. so that we can take a look at it. And we, if you look at page six point five, Leslie's down to seven dollars, and that is primarily due to the uh, their, their biggest taxpayer was New Indy uh, before that Bowater or whatnot. But that their funding from that source has dropped. I uh, met with Leslie, talked to the chief. Um, it's a problem. I think it's a problem that they're dealing with, but it's not a, I'm not going to say it's not a great situation. That's how I put so it So why did there. that, I don't understand why that, why their number went down. Well, first off, the the entire money the county's receiving dropped to start with. Um, that's, they, my, that's my question. Why did it, why did that drop with the, the, the new philo, the, the amount of investment in the new philo was less than they had before. Okay. So to start with, it dropped. There was an expectation that the investment would return, and by the second year, we would be at the levels we were before. 
because of the virus and everything getting delayed, they were not able to ramp up like they had projected. Okay, they still expect to get there. What I think Chairman Cox is referring to, though, that Philo, even when we get back to the same amount, they're going to be getting ten percent less because the counties, mm -hmm. with the ordinance that y'all passed in two thousand and sixteen. Economic development is getting 10% off the top of that. That's in the $500,000 when I spoke about economic development, we're now budgeting that. That was the big driver for that. Now, I have a question. Uh, I think it's within our power to do this, and I know the mayor may not want to do it, but just a thought. Um, if, and you know I'm a big proponent of economic development, but if economic development is getting an extra $524,000 off of that 10% on the top of all these, we have the power to take 86,000 of that and make Leslie whole, don't we? Yes, sir, you do, you do. That, what you have in place is an ordinance, so you need an ordinance to change that, but you could, through the budget process, you could do that. Because that would be um, outside of the, the, the current commitment, and again, committed is a category y'all control. The current commitment is for economic development. I say that very generically. Um, if you're gonna then go move that, that current committed money to something else, you would need to do it as part of the budget ordinance. I mean, I, I think I'm just going to say, based on, on on behalf of any fire department, um, I think any and it would make me look really close closely at any um, fee and lose or anything that we offer these these for economic development. If there's going to be an, a negative impact to to a fire department, um, I mean that that to me just the that should that should that should not happen. That, well, that, that can't happen. I, mean, I, I, can't I hate happen. to say it, but especially to Leslie. I mean, Leslie struggled for a while anyway. And for us to take money away from them mm -hmm. is a tough situation. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I'm not going to support economic development in 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 lieu of fire, fire department. So I think if that's something that can be done, that we that is something that we should try and yeah. I, I agree with you too. Yeah. We we can get the information and we can circulate mm -hmm. that yeah. that spreadsheet. Thank y'all. Mm -hmm. Does anybody have any other questions immediately of of staff for, regarding the budget? We have plenty of opportunities to continue the discussion. Um, if you can make sure that you send us the link so that we can let folks um, have access to that. Um, we're we're going to send out and we're going to put on the website the information here other than all the, the details of the, the two and a half inches. We'll make sure that it's on the website. And we'll also, if I just want to make sure I understood your request, why, we'll email it to council um, the, the Leslie information as well as the amount of the 10% from the new Indy deal. So we'll send that out to council, and we can all digest that between now and the next time we meet as a y'all meet as a council. Okay. Thank you very much. Do Excellent. We, Thanks. Do we have a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. Say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none. We are adjourned.